Good evening. Good evening, Council uh, and uh, staff and any members of the public who are uh, maybe watching us. And uh, uh, I guess, Dan, you are staff as well. Um, so welcome to the September 27th, 2022 uh, meeting of Wolfville Town Council. Uh, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that Wolfville is situated in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And as such, ask that we conduct our business with the seven sacred teachings in mind. Truth, honesty, love, courage, respect, wisdom, and humility. And uh, with that, could I have a motion please uh, for the agenda? So moved, uh, Deputy Mayor Madeira Voss and seconded by Councillor Elliott and CAO, is there anything to add? No, no changes. All in favor of the agenda as received, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, and that is passed. And uh, could I have a motion to approve the town council meeting of July 19th, 2022? I will approve the minutes of the town council meeting of July 19th, 2022 to be approved as circulated and or amended. Thank you, Councillor Butler and a seconder, please. Thank you, Councillor Ingham. Are there any errors or omissions or changes? I do have a, a question and, um, and it may just be uh, my memory, but with the, what is the status of the request read the motion from the RCMP advisory committee? That was an item. So the meeting was canceled. Yes. So we have to reschedule it. Schedule, okay. All right. I should have known that. Anything else, uh, Councilor McKay? Uh, just a question. Uh, there was a, Councilor Elliott asked a question about uh, the parking. And I think CAO said there was a pilot happening, overnight parking for the summer. Is that coming back as a report? Or? Yeah, we can bring that back in terms of how successful or not successful it was. But yeah, we are doing a pilot over the summer. Okay. And we're looking for other options and we'll be talking about parking as part of the library town hall discussion with council. Okay, perfect, great, thank you. Seeing no other lights on, um, all in favor of approval of those minutes as received, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Post. Those are passed. And a motion for the town council in camera meeting of July 19th, 2022. Can you read the, the motion? <laughs> we, had, we had said we would read them. Okay, it's on your motion list. Sorry, no problem. Uh, I move that the minutes of the town council in camera meeting of July 19th, 2022 be approved as circulate and or amended. Thank you, Deputy Mayor and the seconder. Uh, Councillor Proudfoot was the first voice I heard, although I did see hands. Uh, all those in favor of approving those minutes, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, those are passed. Now we have a scintillating presentation from uh, our uh, Remo uh, uh, manager. I'm not sure, Dan, what your title is, but. Re our regional emergency management coordinator, Dan Stovall, welcome back to our council chambers, Dan. Go ahead. Mayor uh, Donovan, council uh, staff, and all those in attendance, thank you very much for this opportunity. As I realize, having once filled a position of town clerk, how valuable your time is. So I thank you for this opportunity. For those who recently attended the September 22nd, a basic emergency management course. There is nothing in this presentation that is matching that. So it's all new information. So I, I will now overload you. I will now overload you with more information to keep you aware. Um, this presentation uh, has started way back when we, uh, well, way back, it seems a long time now ago with a few disasters. Uh, April uh, 2018, when we launched uh, the regional emergency organization, one of the biggest points was to do community outreach. And community outreach was not just a community awareness, but it's now at the point of making staff, municipal councils, and I've done the same presentation in a number of the municipal units, because it allows you to be more prepared at home to support the community in which you're elected to serve. It allows staff to be more prepared and understand that they have to leave their uh, significant others behind to actually come into the emergency center and support an overall disaster. So this emergency preparedness presentation, uh, Nova Scotia Mo keeps saying, how many community halls do you have? Because it just goes on and on. And uh, it's also repeat performances depending on the community. So I'll launch this. <clears throat> this 
The agenda to cover tonight is to look at regional emergency management and why a regional approach. I mean, the organization came into being prior to the start of your tenure as council, uh, somewhere around. Uh, understanding what it means to be prepared for an emergency is key, uh, what the key principles are, and the King's Remo programs. And they kept expanding and expanding as they get more energetic and put a lot more programs out and about. And also any time for questions and answers at the end or any time in between. Why an approach to a regional emergency management? Um, for here in Kings County, when we started this and when I started and first moved back into the town of Wolfville, each municipal unit was doing their own thing. Um, disasters don't have any boundaries. Uh, there's small little things that may take place at a municipal unit, but for the most part, and hurricanes at one point was somewhere down in the middle. Recently, I've moved it back up to the top and we are in a hurricane season till the end of November, as I sadly point out to some people. Uh, floods, power outages, winter storms, pandemics, they take place across borders. Having a regional approach allows us to draw upon staff from four municipal units and come together as a team to actually support the entire of Kings, entirety of Kings County. Impact of severe weather. Severe weather is one of the biggest ones. To date, one of the, the threats biggest in my mind actually is heat. Uh, more people die every year than heat. This is an inconvenience and sadly the gentleman who lost their lives and uh, people are displaced and everything else, but heat kills more people every year than uh, environmental impacts such as this. Uh, but the damage from Fiona is significant uh, across the, the border, albeit some parts of uh, Western Nova Scotia, but as you go up into Sydney and we've all seen the, the videos about Port of Basque, it's uh, catastrophic. For those who were at the BEM, they understand the Nova Scotia Emergency Management Act. Each municipal unit is to have an emergency management plan or an organization. Well, that's fine if each unit does their own little thing within the boundaries of Kings County of a population just over 60,000. But there's multiple agencies that service all of us, whether it's Nova Scotia Health, Social Services, uh, Red Cross, Valley Search and Rescue is a great organization. Department of Natural Resources and Renewables, couldn't fit the re and renewables part up there. Uh, transportation Services, the RCMP. So the RCMP show up in the town of Wolfville for an emergency and say, well, what's your plan say? The next time it's in Berwick, well, what's your plan say? We now as a regional emergency organization have one regional emergency management plan for all of Kings County and the emergency management support plans, heat advisory response system, hurricane, flood, winter storm, and all the evacuation, all of these plans are updated, reviewed, and trained and exercised to, to make sure that we're current across the county. The benefits, I won't go through each one of these uh, dedicated. It's not necessarily my dedication, but it's the point, the fact that I'm hired solely as the regional emergency management. This is my sole focus, my sole job, uh, aside being, being a firefighter, uh, to support Kings County. And there's some areas that still have somebody who's working full-time and they'll tell him to do or her to do emergency management on the side of the desk. You can't, uh, as a, just evident now from this disaster we just had. It's something you have to pay attention to and understand the changing hazard risk vulnerability assessments and things that are taking place in your environment. Uh, consistent planning. The big one I keyed upon in my remit to uh, the advisory committee and the uh, CAOs to whom I report is to come up with an annual work plan. The one consistent line item is the uh, community outreach, and I'll be talking more about that later, but the standard emergency management awareness, this presentation in Scotts Bay, Morden, East Dalhousie is the same. It gets out to the community to understand what the principles are, what the programs available to them are, where comfort centers are. All of that information is consistent across Kings County, because I like to talk. Um, preparing for an emergency. How would everybody be prepared for a minimum of 72 hours? We stress that, and I point out to a lot of communities, understand your power outage. Yes, it's an inconvenience to severity. As a first responder, I'm concerned about the tree that's clapped on a house and life saving. Priority number one in any emergency preparedness issue is life safety. And so understanding that yes, your power's out, but I'm involved as a first responder with trying to get trees cleared to get to somebody who may be in peril or their life may be threatened. Uh, coping without power or tap water, is different everywhere in this county. Uh, when I did this presentation in East Dalhousie, the gentleman said, I have a generator, what do I need you for? Fantastic, sir, take care of yourself. And other areas, people understand the environment they live in and understand the backup that I'm about to buy a generator as well. Uh, and tap water, what people don't realize the environment, the first time moving back into Wolfville, and I love my wife dearly and the disaster and she went to fill the tub up. I said, what are you doing? Because we've lived in so many different locations. We don't need to fill the tub up. You, Wolfville's unique, it has the water. Morton has a great community center, 
no generator, they recognize the importance of water. So they have their two backup generators on their well water. And that's the importance to them to make sure people can stay in their homes and have the water. So every community is slightly different, understanding the risk in those areas of uh, fires and floods. Uh, contacting family and receiving information. Having all that contact information, and I'm a big IT geek, uh, but understand having that little piece of paper in your wallet, one's in my wife's purse that I printed out, uh, having that piece of wallet in your children's uh, car, um, carry back. How many times have you lost power on your phone and oh shoot, I don't know some, somebody's number. Having that key contact list printed out is sometimes a lifesaver if you need that emergency information. Oops, sorry. Key facts, although everybody, and when you talk, people understand and talk about understanding what an emergency kit is and think about it, having a plan and emergency kit are important. But until something like this happens, sadly, with Fiona, they don't realize about having put something together. And understanding the different, different economic makeup of our communities, it's easy. I've gone into people's houses, they've asked for my support, and I can go around and show them what they can put in because they want it all in one location. The fact when they lose power, oh shoot, where was that flashlight? Where was that canned food? But to put it all in one location and have that kit, they can actually bring together a kit. Uh, this is no different actually than first responders. Pre-pandemic, we used to do an annual firefighters conference at Acadia. And I went there as the EMC at the time for the town of Wolfville. And it came up about uh, uh, the Department of Natural Resources. It was the um, wildland fires out west. And I said, oh, here's a group of 60 senior firefighters. And I said, I'm an emergency coordinator. Who has an emergency kit? Like six hands go up out of 60 firefighters. So first responders sometimes don't think about it either, but the community has to think about it. And it's, you can take these kits with you if required. Common misconceptions, most emergencies are short-lived. Well, they're not. We know we're now in a long-term recovery, maybe not so much here, but in parts of uh, Sydney and of course, uh, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, they're gonna be in quite a long-term recovery period. Uh, and most people don't have that impression. They just see the quick impact of something going by and don't realize Fort McMurray is still recovering. And that, well, those wildfires were years ago. Uh, but the economic impact is a big thing. Of course, that there's a lot of the elected officials concerns and things about maintaining that economic viability. I won't have to deal with an emergency and I will not say what community hall it was, but one gentleman actually raised his hand. Um, I've lived off and on back and forth and most people have lived in Nova Scotia longer than myself, but uh, having built, had ice storms in May and winter storms and knowing we're on a hurricane path, I'm surprised the gentleman thought he'd never have to deal with an emergency, but uh, there are emergencies in Nova Scotia. A lot of emergencies I can't prepare for. We cannot stop mother nature, but you can understand the impacts of a hurricane. Power outages, I can be prepared for that. What's in my emergency kit? Uh, do I have a place to go? Uh, what about my loved ones and other family members around me? So there's a lot we can actually do. You can't actually stop the actual imp the impacts of the hurricane, but you can be prepared for that actual emergency. These three key principles are not according to Dan, according to King's Remo. These are actual national principles, uh, get prepared, uh, Public Safety Canada. Know the risks, make a plan, get a kit. And it's uh, something I go over all the time with uh, the community outreach and members of our community. Know your region. Every region around Kings County is even uniquely different. Some are more prone to the wildland urban interface of having a wildfire. Some are more prone to floods. Uh, the flooding that took place over by the hospital in February on Brooklyn Street in that community and understanding your community, what hazards is your specific community involved in and also in your home, what hazards do you have to face and understanding each area that you live in. And I'm getting more accustomed to at one point, I think it was in before uh, Dorian, there was Earl and Earl made the island of Cape Scott because it wiped out a car, the bridge and the other roadways and things. So uh, there's a lot of hazards that people may not be aware of. You aren't prepared to actually make a plan. Planning's not in isolation. We have an emergency management planning committee in Kings Remo. I may do the grunt work, but it gets picked apart by the planning committee before it goes to the advisory committee for review. From everybody's home life and having your family prepared, you include your children, you include your, your, all your family members when you put together this plan. Does everybody understand about emergency exits and how to get out? Also having a copy of your plan with your, your emergency kit. And it's not a brick of paper. Our plans are constantly annually reviewed. And out of a real life episode such as this that took place, we revise and update and the plans that are kept current. And keeping copies of your plans in a safe and memorable place are important, whether it's online, on a USB stick, or actually printed out with your emergency kit. Those brochures I handed out 
uh, because uh, at the start of this, doing community outreach, I quite understand when I say something's online, I don't have a computer, I don't have a cell phone. Everywhere I go, I take printed material. Printed material is king, it gets in their hands. That will walk you through the steps. You can actually do it online through the Get Prepared website. It takes you 20 minutes to put together an emergency plan for your house. Your family plan, understanding your household and your emergency exits out of your house, every room. People don't look at windows as emergency exits, but every room needs two exits. And understanding things, whether you're putting an escape ladder for your children out their bedroom or other things and having that emergency exit. The family meeting area is not just the big tree in front of the house. That's for two or three in the morning. But if we take, have a disaster that strikes and it's uh, two in the afternoon and your significant others in Halifax and somebody else is down in Yarmouth, where are you going to have a regional meeting place to actually connect with your family members? Family members are all important. Everybody's the calls I got at the uh, emergency center, Vernon, BC. I'm worried about my sister. I can't go to hold of her in Avondale until we went through things and all this. But she couldn't get a hold of her. And I told her why and alleviated her fears. But getting a hold of family is important. Escape routes from neighborhoods. We have a lot of communities, and emergency planning should be dovetailed in with the planning department when it's new communities because a lot of places here in uh, Kings County, in Nova Scotia, one way in, one way out. And that's how they're set up. Uh, Morden, unless I bring in the Navy off the uh, coast of Bay of Fundy to escape people out of Morden, if there's a wildfire that spreads through there, they don't have any way out. So understanding your communities and how to make your way out of those communities is important. Ensuring help for people with special needs. Um, I'll get more into the vulnerable persons registry. There's different special needs. Ours and looking at our vulnerable persons registry is focused on People are living at home longer. The long-term care facilities have to have plans in place for their clients. I participate with these facilities in their emergency annual exercises, but the fact that we have more and more people living at home alone. 619 people died in British Columbia last year because of the heat dome. 98% of them were living at home alone. So understanding where the, uh, your vulnerable people are at home and everything else, I'll talk about that later on with the vulnerable persons registry. Choosing out of contact. Bell, East Links, who had problems on cell phones? Well, I'm just lucky, I guess. <laughs> um, or when uh, recently, of course, we had the Bell outage, then before that, the East Link outage. At times, you may have a local issue, but you may have an out of contact. Personally, for myself and my wife, Deborah, we have a very good friend in Ottawa. I will be busy because of the job description of what I do. So if my wife's trying to find me, she knows she can't get a hold of me to call our friends in Ottawa so that when I finally check in, if I can't reach her, I'll call my friends in Ottawa just to be able to check. So having an out of province contact is somebody just as important on your list. Arrangements through fans or fam community centers. Nova Scotia strong. Uh, These community centers having been to almost every single one here in Kings County, there are people and neighbors helping neighbors. Doesn't matter to them, they don't have a generator. They'll come together and try to help. Um, our fire department in Canning during the uh, last of Dorian, uh, firefighters have a specific role to play in life safety. They were being called upon to do wellness checks and getting tired doing it. And so that's when we called, we had resource requirements. We called Nova Scotia CMO, had military from CFP Greenwood go to Canning to support the wellness checks. So that's everything that took place. Practicing the plan, putting all these bricks of paper together that we've put together as an organization mean nothing unless you actually train and exercise, have the table talk discussions, have the actual live exercise. We've had to postpone a number of times now with the flood functional exercise we were gonna have in the Kentville area because of the the pandemic restrictions, but we have it coming up in April of next year. Reviewing the plan annually, that's something I take on, bring the reports back to the planning committee, review if there's no changes, then no changes. There's some changes coming up uh, the next advisory committee meeting in April, oh, sorry, in October. <clears throat> so you're all prepared for 72 hours, minimum of 72 hours. What is it, throw some things out, where you're gonna have in your basic items in your emergency kits at home? Flashlight. Yeah. How much water? Two liters per day, perhaps. Um, that two liters per person is if we will not live as long without water as we would with food. So understanding you may need more water than that, depending, that's just the, for, for drinking, let alone thinking about sanitary purposes and everything else. I keep, my wife laughs at me. I keep cases of water. No, my house is not a comfort set. I keep cases of water uh, downstairs or I rotate through it and use it so it doesn't sit stagnant. But when I see it on sale, I just buy water and it's downstairs. Uh, water flashlight, one of the good ones, it, it does cost a bit more, the wind-up flashlight. So you're not always annually checking your batteries or you forget to check your batteries and then by the time you need it, it doesn't work. Radio. Radio, yes. Working with 
the radio stations, all the support in the world from Darren Harvey. Uh, I love my interviews with him uh, every time, uh, Rewind. They're syndicated though. And uh, somebody up on the North Mountain called me and said, Dan, I followed your advice. I have a radio, but when does Remo speak? Uh, the fact that I cannot actually say Remo's going to speak from the top of the hour, five minutes, top of the hour, five minutes, because being syndicated, they just let it, it's on a remote loop. Uh, Darren was actually in this weekend and he was giving me all kinds of support from Re Rewind, getting messages out. But for the most part, trying to coordinate with radio stations of saying, call Remo. Remo's now going to speak for the next five minutes at the top of the hour. So turn your radio on, turn your radio off. That's still being worked on. So we've got those items. Food. Yeah, yeah. yeah phone numbers. And there's, there's basic items, no matter what the makeup of your family is, are going to be the same in all our households. And I've gone in and helped people and just picking things off shelves and showed them that you don't have to spend a lot of money. Everybody's worried. There's the kits you can buy from these companies called 72 Hours. Uh, Red Cross even sells kits. But for the most part, people have things at home, but it's putting it in one location. Because if you lose power in the middle of the night and it's dark, where's the flashlight? Where am I getting things? I can't see you. Where am I getting things? So these basic items should be consistent, everybody. Understand the one house I went to was great. It was uh, like an Ikea shelf and cans everywhere. And it took me a few minutes to finally ask where their can opener was. And they went, they looked at each other and went, oh, I'll go get one. So they didn't have a can opener. And I have freeze dried and other packaged things we have set up, but not necessarily. If you're going to have cans, make sure you have a can opener. These basic items go with every household. The emergency kit is important. Now with the background of being a firefighter, I would say at times what is more important is understanding what emergency go bag brings. That kit may not be ready to grab and go. It could be in a big uh, plastic drum or anything else somewhere in your house. A grab and go bag is exactly that. It's a knapsack. It has your essentials, your documents, cash. Make sure you keep checking. Somebody might take the cash, but uh, the cash in it. And it should be one for each member of the family. I wasn't pointing at you, sorry. <laughs> um, the issue here is, and I've gone to somebody, and this is what we're going to practice. We have uh, the evacuation awareness packages. We're not actually doing an evacuation in April. Knock on someone's door. You have 30 minutes to evacuate. There's a wildfire approaching. Well, what do I take? I don't know. We're leaving in 30 minutes. And, and so understand if your environment is wildfire conducive and you live in a beautiful area of trees and all this, the evacuation, the short notice evacuation is more going to take place because of wildfire. You may have the advanced notice of warning with weather because of floods and things, but floods can actually overfill banks quickly and you may have to just evacuate. Um, but that emergency go bag, my wife and I have one each and I tell her if you evacuate, please take both. But if she doesn't, at least we have the one. It would change out seasonal clothing. Coming closer to the winter, I take out the summer things I had in it. I put in a sweater, track pants, and then everything else. And we have mirror image USB sticks. And I'll show you that for documents and other things that are in there. Uh, all those documents are important as well. Special items to consider. I have my last prescription of glasses because you're all nice little fuzzy blurs right now. Um, I guess if I didn't have to read anything, it'd be okay. But having your glasses, medications, working with Nova Scotia Health, some people cannot get week long subscriptions of their medications. And Nova Scotia Health goes, oh, that's okay. We have them in our database. Power outage, your, your system crashes. Oh, I, with my previous, before she passed away, my cousin, I actually helped her write out a list of prescriptions to put in her emergency go bag. So if I had to grab her and go to a shelter somewhere, I could go, this is what she needs. And so having that list for some people who may be on more medications than others is something you can help your seniors or other people with that they might need. And of course, uh, I have a new dog. Food for pets is important to uh, games. It impacts us. I can see the trauma on those people up in port bass more so children at times. Understand if this is their favorite stuffed toy, let them have it, but maybe get another one and put it in the emergency go bag. If you're in a shelter and all of a sudden with the shelters will not provide toys and things. So if you are there with that comfortable toy for your child where they need diapers and other things, all of those things are unique to your family. Don't forget copies and documents. Uh, my wife laughed at me when that was not quite a picture of my binder, but she could never carry the binder that I put together. So I made it very easy for her. Um, we now have duplicates, USB sticks in both. And people often say, yes, there's the cloud. I'm still hesitant to put my passport and other things on the cloud. So I have those two USB sticks and it has all our documents. And now as a firefighter, I keep pointing this out, I've been to too many house fires, three in the morning. They're not convenient. Family of four in pajamas, nothing. Um, ours is life-saving, property preservation as much as possible. And we try to preserve the property after we put the fire out, but they've just lost everything and they didn't have a go bag, anything else. It'll, it, 
it just takes more time now with your documents and things. If you had that go bag, you have that background to be able to go to a shelter. So that was the three key principles. Uh, know the risk, make a plan, get a kit. See, I told you it was different than the BEM. And uh, having those principles in the back of your head, you're always doing the, uh, that hazard risk vulnerability system. In our community, your family makeup changes. You're now empty nesters, so I don't have to worry about the children anymore. And so every, every one of us goes through changes insofar as a family composition, or you may have a relative who's moved here and you're watching in another house. So that has to be done annually and just kind of look at things and scan the environment you live in. These programs, I promise I won't take hours. These are programs and we've put quite a bit together since uh, April, 2018, when we launched Remo, are uh, quickly things I want to run through with you. Uh, from our, the websites, the uh, memorandum of understanding, I would say use common terminology. Uh, MOU is a memorandum of understanding. I talk about comfort centers, so the emergency mail notification system, alert ready, I am responding. Uh, vulnerable persons registry, our social media and community outreach. And I always point out to the two members of the uh, advisory committee, now I tape, turn it over to you to spread it out to the public. Um, and I'll show you how quickly social media grows uh, just after this little incident. But uh, I appreciate all of your support. I appreciate the members of the advisory committee, planning committee. I so said, don't go a breath without saying, oh, did you know we have a kingsremo.ca website? And I usually mention it once a day, that's once. For the website, we launched this in September 2019. It came about that period of getting into Remo, understanding what we wanted to progress because of people coming forward, where do I find this? Uh, Getprepared.gc.ca, well, where do I find this? Nova Scotia EMO, but their website now is provincial guidelines and very limited as to what's there, so you might go there. Okay, and try the, no, sorry. Kingsremo.ca, one website has it all. The know the risk, make a plan, get a kit principles are there. Uh, the resources. There's many of the flyers that I put out on social media, all that information. Our plans are not done in isolation, they're community plans. All our plans are posted up on this website as well that come up. Um, all the contacts and understanding with the non-emergency numbers of fire departments, the regional and provincial numbers that are important, uh, comfort centers, uh, I'll show that website, and also a series of frequently asked questions in the vulnerable persons registry. Uh, there's been minor updates, but it's been uh, pretty consistent on what we have there and there's some good feedback coming out about the website. Recently, and this was shared with uh, not just first responders, I shared it through uh, emergency mail and other things. There's a great website, even though they call it Nova Scotia First Responders Hub, it's an open source for anybody uh, to access. It provides on-scene and incident tools, which people may not use because they're not firefighters, but are first responders. But the weather resources are really good. They're all the links for Environment Canada and looking at weather. Uh, maps and mapping tools, situational awareness tools, and miscellaneous resources. So this has started being shared. This link is yet to be, but it will be up on our uh, King's Remo website as well as a resource. For MOs using agreements, um, I always have the expression of sometimes with people, what happens when Dan leaves? Nothing. This will carry on. Uh, and I'm a big believer in the small communities of the handshake and the promise. But who's the promise with? Uh, a lot of the fire departments, 13 of them across Kings County, have verbal agreements for fuel during disasters, but they're not written, and that's up to the fire departments. We put together a transportation uh, back with the previous manager of Kings Transit, and now Michael Getchell fully supports, and he's fantastic. We actually exercised this during the propane fire in New Minas, uh, I'm trying to, it all blends into one, a year ago, and we had to look at doing an evacuation, and we called up, activated, and brought in the bus. These buses can be brought in as warming buses. In the middle of the winter, I need to put somebody temporarily on a bus while we set up shelters. Uh, so it's a really good program. It used to be that every um, emergency, sorry, all of the long-term care facilities, you ask them, oh, we have a verbal agreement with King's Transit, or we have a verbal agreement. So now they would call me if there's an evacuation, we have the agreement with actually uh, King's Transit. It's also a source to be able to transport first responders. If there was a pile of first responders, the military coming in usually have their own vehicles. But if there's other first responders, we can call up and get the buses. The Regional Emergency Management Mutual Aid, when we're beyond our resource capability in Kings Remo, all the time we're doing things, I'm constantly emailing the Provincial Coordination Center, Nova Scotia MO is the next level resource. I said, well, hold up, why should that be? We have three counties that surround us. And so we actually have an active, and it was approved at our last, our previous advisory committee back in May, uh, between Kings County and Annapolis County. We mirrored that and sent it off to both Lunenburg and to West Hans. Lunenburg had some small wordsmithing. 
did not change the content of providing that emergency management support. It went to the planning committee this month and now it's going to the advisory committee and then we're gonna get all the mayors and uh, warden signatures and that side of us is covered. And so it's something then the next steps after having these in place, once again, training and exercise. Let's activate this, let's activate our ECC, communicate between us, what resources can we provide to uh, the other county and see what's required. Comfort centers, um, again, uh, it's a this community helping community, a lot of them activate, a lot of people want to, and supporting the building up of our comfort centers is the fact that Kings County has a generator program. Some of these fantastic comfort centers uh, just didn't have the money to put into a generator, more than put their money into their uh, generators for their water. They've got a beautiful, it's not a dilapidated comfort center by any, or community center by any means, but the generator program puts $8,000 up front, uh, building inspection, signing of the agreement with Kings Remo and another $2,000. I'll talk more about one of the new financial aids just announced by the minister at the uh, yesterday. Uh, all our comfort centers are identified off our website and I'll talk about how they're all announced as well. The references that cover our comfort centers, uh, once again, I didn't want this as a verbal agreement. We went carefully through a memorandum of understanding agreement as part of the policy. The policy went to each municipal council and is signed by each municipal council with their policy number on it. But it says the same thing here as it does in Berwick, as it does in uh, Municipality of Kings, as it does in Kentville. Uh, so the policies are all the same, just the numbers are different because they're municipal policies. The memorandum of understanding, we now have one in place for all 24 comfort centers across Kings County. Comfort centers is stressing to people. They're not overnight shelters. If there is a wide scale emergency evacuation, six of those facilities are identified as emergency shelters. That's when Red Cross comes in. Those facilities, uh, when I first put the MOU together with New Minus, New Minus said, oh, we don't have a cot. That's because they said that they didn't tick off the box about being a shelter. I said, that's not your responsibility. Red Cross across uh, here, if they don't have enough, they'll reach out. Red Cross is very much like Department of Natural Resources Renewable. They'll go to where the disaster is. So if they need to call out, get cots for the rest of Nova Scotia from anywhere nationally across Canada, they'll bring the cots in here to set up the shelter as required. It's a place to get warm, recharge your devices. Everybody's tied into those electronic devices, or washrooms, warm drink, check on each other, share information. My one information source, although I still try to pass everything through the people who sign up for emergency emails, and I put a lot of who gets emails from them, uh, put out a lot of information, um, but it's getting the update. I can send out now one consistent update to those 24 primary secondary contacts at all the comfort centers. So the message is the same about the weather, whether you're in Scotts Bay, Morden, or where else, the information is the same across Kings County. The anomaly here, I will bring up this since we're here in Wolfville, is the fact that it's not a community center, it's a school. This all started when I was the emergency coordinator for the town of Wolfville. Uh, due to the age of the Wolfville school, and uh, sorry, the Wolfville fire hall, and that backup generator being used for the firefighters and their families, I think once historically before I ever arrived, it had been used briefly as a comfort center. But we had an opportunity with the rebuild of the school for the town to provide a generator, and now with the MOU that's in place with the Annapolis Valley Regional Center of Education. At the time, the school board, but I've talked to David Floyd and there's no change to the MOU. It's still in agreement with the MOU and emergency management. We can activate and use the Wolfville School. It was done during Dorian. It's having the staffing there, the community staff as required by whether it's council or community group. It's a great facility because it's one of the main shelters as well. There are showers. The step up from the comfort center to that shelter is having showers. Port William said, oh, we're a shelter as well. I said, well, you're not. Well, we have a shower for the firefighters, right? It's for the firefighters. There's not a separate shower within your facility that can be used by the public. The staffing issue, I understand it goes on, or even at the point to, depending on how things are, powers here, we can easily spread out through King's Remo social media, other things, drop by town hall, come charge your devices. It doesn't have to be an official community center, depending on the duration of the disaster, uh, but responsibility for staffing resources, liabilities with battle of the local jurisdiction. When uh, Port Williams, we don't want to sign this. We don't want Remo coming in and taking over. And I said, Remo, that O, oh, the word organization is me. I'm not coming in to take anything over. I'm supporting the ECC managers when we activate the emergency center, making sure everything is there staffed and running. So I'm not there to take over a comfort center. And I said, if we say, if you're directed to activate because it's run by community volunteers, 
write down. We can have people here from 12 to four and then six to eight, because I'm not gonna tell any comfort center, you have to be open from eight to eight because it's all based on their volunteers and the volunteers may have disasters at their own homes. So if the community comes back in Port Williams or any of the comfort centers, we're open 12 to four and four to eight. That's what gets published. And my recommendation is it's not staff, especially for the anomaly of town of Wolfville, because all of staff have key positions in the emergency center. And typically you would only activate a, a comfort center when it's a disaster level type scenario that you're actually looking at. You've got staff busy. I think that first night as we joke and call it Team Wolfville, all the staff in the emergency center in Colebrook was from uh, the staff of Wolfville. On that one. So just, I wanted to take this chance to talk about our comfort center here. So when we were in Dorian, and it was starting to be a few days and we realized that comfort centers were going to be required, particularly the one in Wolfville, the realization of we didn't really have a community group to manage that hit. And so at the time, um, I remember sitting at the ECC, I contacted council via email just to say, would anyone be interested? Because we recognized that that was a deficiency we hadn't planned for. And so council did step up. We opened, I think a lot of you that were on council at that time really you know, showed up for a few days to really help out. After that, we did do some planning. We had one councillor offer to kind of lead that. But the challenge with that is that councillors will change. A lot of the volunteers that were recruited change. <laughs> and so, you know, then you come into another um, incident like we just had with Fiona and we weren't really in much better of a spot. So we've, we've done a little bit of discussion offline, the mayor and I, and we, we do have a community group that's ready to step up. The Lions Club is willing to do that for us with support from the Rotary. Um, which I think would be fantastic. Offline, we can work with them because they've also offered their facility and Dan will talk about another program, but we may even be able to pivot and look at using their facility in, instead of the school. We would still have the school as an option, but it as might be shelter. easier, yeah. So um, I just wanted to make sure the council was comfortable with that because having a community group lead it, we don't have to worry about it from a municipal perspective. All of the other 23 comfort centers are done by community groups, not the municipalities themselves. They were very eager you know, there was no arm twisting, they, they really would like to take it on. So if council is comfortable with that, I think that would be a really good solution. And we wanted to bring it up tonight because as Dan reminds me, we're still in hurricane season and he's watching for the next weekend. And I don't want to get to another point where we're scrambling to try to get folks to, to manage that. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, but. Uh, no, just that um, the president of the Lions, uh, not only eager, but apparently the Lions Hall has been certified by Red Cross as an emergency center. So, and they were trying to figure out how they could become the. Not unless they have a generator. That's what they, but they yeah. need a generator. Yeah. That's the situation. Anyways, very eager and a number of the Wolfville or the Mud Creek Rotarians also looked at financial support and volunteer support. So I think we'll have that in place very soon. Who would be contacting them? Who would be contacting to make to organize this? I'm meeting with Frank shortly, but then then there yeah. will be an MOU, so it would be. Banned. And then they sign the MOU with me, and I have every single. We have a database. It's available from WebEOC is another plan uh, program, but we have every primary secondary contact email, cell phone number, and I'll show you the I am responding. That pre hurricane, I launched an email about a week prior saying, please get your plans in place, understand what it means to be open as a comfort center, acknowledge this. And I had acknowledges back from everybody. Somebody came back and said, oh, they're no longer here. Here's a secondary contact. Because the database of contacts, as we all know, is only as good as I keep maintaining. I guess I just wanted to clarify that if there is a situation, then you're the person yes. who will contact the lead for the volunteer group that's going to be looking. I'll explain how it opens up. They'd actually be contacting me if they wanted to open up because I have the intelligence, not up here, but the, the weather side of intelligence to understand, don't open a comfort center. And I told everybody when I sent a message out a week, there's gonna be no comfort centers open Saturday. Some called up and did open up and all we got all day from Nova Scotia Power, stay off the roads, you're in the way. Uh, understand we don't wanna put people's, priority number one, safety of life. So opening up a comfort center in the middle of a hurricane with trees coming down, power lines coming down. I had in Dorian, when Aaron and I were there at the emergency center, two hours into it as we're watching trees go sideways outside the emergency center, somebody called up and said, where's my emergency center? Understand your 72 hour preparedness, shelter in place. And at the height of Dorian, we had 16 facilities open across Kings County. Uh, but they call me first, they can open anytime they want. 
Uh, if they're directed to open, we've had enough number of calls from Port Williams area. Did you know about this? I need you to be open. The direction from King's Remo, there's a re re reimbursement to generate fuel costs and if they use water and coffee and things like that. So there is a way to get reimbursed for those costs. If they open on their own, there's no reimbursement, but they are there to help their community. Yeah, because we went to the meeting on Thursday and became abundantly clear that we really did not have a plan as we were all kind of scrambling, um, which is why we put in a request for addition to the agenda, but now we don't need that anymore. So that's good, but happy to hear it's uh, taken place. Um, this comes from my previous life in the military and having media training, but I believe in the, the news. Um, I'm probably one of the few Remo guys who actually had that CBC interview and all the time with Darren Harvey. If I call him, want five minutes with Darren in the morning, he's just, I get the time. And it's fantastic because that's what people listen to, uh, CBC, uh, the local radio, and having that, uh, whether I'm sounding calm or not, but the calm assured voice out to people and telling them what's going on is important. So I have the, a database of local news media. When we sent out the news alert about activating our emergency center and here's our public hotline, that's when CBC called me. Oh, can we call you at four in the morning? Yep, I'll be there. And so we got the call and uh, they uh, talked to us. Uh, local municipal websites understand outages. I don't have internet, but we still make sure the information goes to absolutely every source there is to get the information out to people. Social media, uh, across the board, I have all the contacts for public information officer, right, Bob? Or <laughs> to get it out and it gets uh, uh, out and shared from Kings Remo to the municipal units and everywhere else. Uh, Nova Scotia EMO and Nova Scotia 211. My remit is to report to Nova Scotia EMO. Typically, they flip it then to Nova Scotia 211, but not a matter of not trusting, but of making trust but verify. I have the contact at Nova Scotia 211, so I send it to them as well. So if you go to the Nova Scotia 211 website and Nova Scotia EMO website, when they launched the Comfort Center website, which they did for this, they did for Dorian. Um, the nice thing now for this, their link for Kings County says Kings County website, and they have the link to our website. I finally got, because I said, Andrew goes, uh, the pr province said yes, Dan, not everybody has a website. But now they have a link to our website, because I can go to the back end, indicate whether it's open, closed, time of operations, and we set that all up. But understand our residents here, maybe in Sydney, maybe somewhere else, and they don't know the local environment. The local environment you're talking to the people here is the fact that you go to Nova Scotia 211, click the emergency preparedness link, it will indicate every comfort center that's open across the province. So having that awareness from our community that we all travel and do things and get away for weekends when we can. And so we're having that information is available. Um, I will specifically talk about this next one, the emergency email notification system, but I send that out as well. I'm sure you get some emails from Dan Stovall uh, and the King's Remo website. It gets updated and all the information there with the uh, back end of the uh, Comfort Center website. Uh, this is the latest thing. And now whether it applies to the Lions Club, I'm not sure. I'm going to make sure I definitely bring it to the attention of Morden. Uh, one of the significant programs that I think is huge and we could expand here. I mean, we have a, a good support network here, but having more is not a bad idea. Uh, community centers and generators. One item of concern in our province was our community centers need our support. Now should be the time to rely on them for sources of comfort for their communities. As a longer term measure, the government will be announcing 2 million fund that will be available for community centers. That's why I'm not sure if the Lions Club is termed how that works. There's more details coming out in the coming weeks. Uh, community centers to help with cost of purchasing and installing generators. Uh, details of the program will be announced in the coming weeks. The issue a lot of times is it's fine to install, but what does that organization have in place to then maintain it? It's not maintenance every six months. It's typically uh, East Dalhousie. They just called up and said, we just pay, paid, and of course, some of these small community houses, we just paid $400 to maintain, and well, they're great. They maintain it, East Dalhousie's ready. Uh, they didn't have to open the comfort center this time in East Dalhousie, uh, but it cost them $400. So I talked to the individual who leads the generator program, Municipality of Kings. We're at a steady state. We have one more community center, Grafton Community Hall is in the process of installing a generator. Can that generator fund, because unless you use it, you lose it. My old uh, background of having a huge budget. And so I said, can we use that budget to provide for those facilities who want to maintain their generators? It's up to them. I don't come in with maintenance people, but now that fund, they actually got a reimbursement. And as Terry Brown said, you think he had just handed him a thousand ton brick of gold. Uh, just that $400 is big in some of the communities. So that maintenance is now gonna be taken care of within our uh, budget that we have. 
more, to, more details out of all the programs announced, I'm most interested from an emergency preparedness side looking at that. Emergency emails, so I had set up with the emergency management when I was coordinator just for the town of Wolfville. People just want to know. Understand they may not look at emails, but I have now probably over 3,000 uh, when I hit send uh, on a number of uh, emails that go out and it's growing every time, sadly, because of a disaster it grows. With the acknowledgement when somebody wants to subscribe, everything is sent blind carbon copy. I'm not sharing personal email address with anybody else who is on that subscription list. I put out advanced notifications. I use news releases. First of June, hurricane season till the end of uh, November. Understand this is forecast to be an above average season. Uh, right in the middle of March 15th, wildfire season. What can you do to protect your property? Those are general awareness. These other ones I've also sent out the rainfall warning, wind warning, tropical storm warnings all came out and I quickly was able to generate those emails to send them out to people. And I have one woman on the North Mountain who no matter what I send out, I always replies and I take time to reply back to her. Thanks for coming. Alert Ready. Uh, it's a system that was initially in place with just television and radio and every, we all knew it as something to do with uh, the uh, alerts, Amber Alerts for Children. Uh, it has grown such that as a regional emergency organization, now the releasing authority for these messages is the chief administrative officer. We're a Remo, so I submitted the inquiry and they said, oh, we hadn't thought about that. And I said, great, what's your answer? And the fact that if it's unique to Wolfville, I can't get a hold of Erin or her designated alternate, I can have any CAO, CAO release the message. We're a regional emergency organization, so there should be no delay in getting out the alert because of that. Whether it's a non-broadcast intrusive, such as a boil water advisory, or broadcast intrusive, such as Hurricane Fiona. Who got that alert on the phones? Yeah, most people. So it is a, it's a one step up. We have systems in place, but this is something now that we can use as emergency managers. I can draft the message and get a hold of the CAO and be able to get the message out because there's a significant threat to our community. I am responding. All the fire departments use it, so I was used to it. I get nonstop uh, unsolicited calls from a Buoyant Red and Alert Red. There's all these companies that have these systems at thousands of dollars. We just renewed a three-year contract with uh, Alert Ready. I think it was nine hundred dollars U.S. dollars, and it's an emer I use it. It's a very capable system. We use it for emergency management for emergency text. Uh, how many people will actually hear that text and look at a text before they look at an email? So making sure who's gotten text from me? A couple, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but it allows me to set up to fifty groups. I have a group that's just the ECC managers because I sometimes just send them notes with something that I just have to send a quick text for. Um, the regional EM advisory committee is a separate group. The planning committee is a separate group. Elected officials, those who have signed up, I didn't think when I first asked that there's some who didn't sign up, I'd have to look who didn't. But I actually use it to actually then click on for uh, Town of Wolfville, Town of Campville, all the elected officials, because my job is to keep the advisory committee, but sorry, I'm trying to keep all the elected officials aware. Uh, municipal staff, so at times uh, Department of Public Works or other organizations, it's just as important for them to know what's going on, whether they're part of the emergency email notification system or this system. Fire departments, I can send one quick text to all of the fire chiefs, and uh, they love me, uh, and sending that message out allows them to know that if you need resources, uh, don't call me 24 and 7 on my phone, we've activated the emergency center, here's the operations number. And it worked great. There were no calls that came in. There were calls before in February, uh, back when we had the flooding and things that took place. Uh, but that was for some sandbags. We didn't activate Remo per se, but I dealt with it and was able to get sandbags delivered to a couple locations. But having that, being able to text the chiefs and send them out specific details, and as well the comfort centers. They're all logged every single primary, secondary contact. When I say I want your email address, your cell phone and service provider. That's the, I need the service provider. And now, so instead of just sending them an email, I can actually send the comfort centers, heads up, the storm is about to hit. Uh, the vulnerable persons registry. Uh, when we talk vulnerable persons, understand our community makeup. This is not necessarily the vulnerable persons who are homeless and things. This is targeted, this program, hats off to Sault Ste. Marie. It was mirrored on the Sault Ste. Marie uh, Innovation Center when they set up their program in Sault Ste. Marie. At a cost of $1, they sent us all the registration process and software. We modified it to meet our needs, but I still have an acknowledgement statement on our VPR website. And the gentleman there who's still leading it to this day, was quite thankful for that. Uh, but they were the ones who led us. And anybody who inquires, I steer them to Sault Ste. Marie because they're the ones who initiated this. 
but it's also understanding that our community makeup, we're seeing more and more people live at home longer alone. They're not going to care facilities where they have to have emergency plans in place for their clients and everything else. More and more people are living home. 98% of the people who died in BC were living at home alone. And so having this whole person's registry, I can generate a report based on a wide scale evacuation for Wolfville, understand in this apartment block, you have somebody who has mobility, sight, hearing. And so we can send out, I can send out a separate report to um, uh, Nova Scotia Power. Uh, they have a critical customer communication program. It doesn't guarantee the power will come back on. It guarantees they'll check with the people and their clients. Uh, but we, and it's hard to get that report from them, but I can send our report to uh, Nova Scotia Power. And our waiver is very clear when people sign. I just got one in the mail. Uh, another one to sign into the program. So it's great. It's slowly growing because it's community awareness. This is the first opportunity and I'll show you the numbers. Community awareness is for me getting out, giving brochures, hospitals, doctors, offices, and there's a little pandemic that slowed us up somewhat in the past. It aims at improving the safety of residents living at home who would be at greater risk during emergencies and improves safety by providing key information to emergency response teams in order to keep them more aware when addressing large scale emergencies. 100% voluntary, 100% free. Uh, it's not a database that's maintained down in the US. It's maintained at 181 Colebrook Village Park Drive. The one on T Tech and myself have access to it and that's it. It's not the personal information that's gonna be shared anywhere else and that was a concern. And if you're concerned, don't register. The waiver is very clear. This does not replace your requirement to call 911 if there's an emergency. It's not an automated system. It doesn't replace the requirement for you or your caregiver, they sometimes have VO and other caregivers to have an actual emergency plan in place for yourself. It's one other step that we can take for our growing populations that's starting to live alone and has vulnerabilities that if we have an evacuation, we can support that part of our community. Dan? Yes. That's so good. <laughs> so good. But I'm pretty sure it's matched with the senior safety program. Am I correct? They, I gave uh, Michelle Parker all of the flyers. So she, Michelle Parker and I, she does all the flyer handouts. She takes all the flyers. and everything. Yeah, because she knows who's really vulnerable. Yep. And I, not being remiss, I'm a bit busy now, but I'm trying to get out to VON, Care Force, doctor's offices. Uh, it's very easy to try for all these brochures and it's, it's community awareness. It is growing slowly. It started off pretty quick and then we had some pandemic to shut things down a bit. Uh, I tried these presentations virtual. People are tired of Zoom and everything else. I like being out in the community, but I'm hesitant myself because of personal circumstances around people. So um, this is starting to grow more, which is a good thing. Social media. Um, I was never a social media user. My lovely wife said, this is our social media account. I go, right, I don't even know what it was. Um, we now have Kings Reno social media. It's important to connect and cooperate. Uh, coordinate with organizations, understand it is not a 911 service. If you look at some very high level surveys that have gone out from Public Safety Canada, people think that if I text on uh, to the RCMP that I have an emergency, they should respond to that. It doesn't replace 911. Uh, we on our social media for Kings Remo have made it reliable sources. It's not Al Jazeera. I've actually banned five people because it's not a political discussion that somebody, somebody took to I gave people typically three strikes, but I'm not into a political side. I say it's not 24 and seven, but my, if you ask my wife, it is because I take the time to respond to everybody who posts questions and has queries. And I got questions about comfort centers in Cumberland, but okay, I'll answer that. And so I sent them the information on how to find that. Now, uh, our Facebook follower, uh, we market quarterly and I update it quarterly based on the planning committee, advisory committee, but it's consistent growth. Uh, that 725 back in uh, March was at the start when you consider when the uh, uh, things sometimes got busier with the pandemic, I was sending out information, uh, but having almost 400 in three days uh, because of uh, this. And I occasionally click on uh, the identity and I saw Frankville, where's Frankville? And it's up by Port Hawkesbury. But I've got, okay, I don't mind if I have the whole province following me, I really don't. But uh, understanding we're Kings Remo and that's the focus and uh, although environmental impacts can be a broader scope. Uh, so we've grown quite, uh, Andrew uh, is a bit worried at the provincial level because I keep threatening that I retire at 5,000 followers. Mm -hmm. So um, we're seeing if I can get to 5,000. For, uh, for Twitter, not as much, but it is growing. 
uh, and I mirror a lot of posts. Of course, we have to parse them down, understand the number of text characters you can have. But again, a significant growth in a short period of time because of the pandemic. Uh, and Instagram, not so much. I sometimes I must admit I forget, but I try to get things out on Instagram. But I've threatened the planning committee and they all laughed at me. You will not say Remo Dan on TikTok. I will not be doing a dance on TikTok to promote Remo uh, programs. Uh, so I'm not on TikTok, but these three social media accounts are key across our, our Kings County. And that whole, whole awareness thing and the uh, advisory committee members hear me often say it. Now for all of you as elected officials, if people are asking you about emergency preparedness information, please share about Kings Remo social media. Community outreach, exactly what this is. The fact that now you have a better idea in so far as preparing things maybe at your houses and looking at things to be able to actually be out in the community in disaster because you know your significant others are taken care of back at home. My wife just doesn't expect me to come back home when there's a disaster, but that's okay. Um, in 2018, we did we, we kicked it off in a half a year. We did 16 sessions, or we. I did 16 sessions across the county, and I think Aaron was kind of watching my overtime because I say what whatever time you want, and so it's always 7 in the evening. And I went to East Dalhousie and the guys, that, even the folks here in Wolf of Fire Hall, that's in Kings County. You leave Kings County, but yes, it's in Kings County. Uh, and so getting around this county, I now know more than some of you our local firefighters. Uh, 2019 was a really good push, 31 sessions in, uh, and these were mostly evening sessions. I did even did a session with the 100 women who care. As I said, it's not just our community halls, it's anybody who lives here. I'm, I've even gone to one house who brought in three other households and we just set it up on a blanket and projector. I have a projector and talked in somebody's house. Um, so if I have the opportunity to talk, you can tell I'll talk. Uh, emergency preparedness is key in getting this information across to people. Uh, 2021, huge impact, and we can all know why. Uh, there was no flavor towards doing these meetings virtually. And with things going on in the reporting cycle that I was doing with the COVID, I didn't have the time personally either to start trying to get around. But we've started increasing the interest now this is the fifth one in 2022. I'm doing this again tomorrow night in New Minus. I sent out a call to all the firefighters, fire chiefs, and the first one to pick me up was James Redmond in New Minus. Uh, and I, this is not for just your firefighters, this is for their families. And I think Jim's even writing in the village commission tomorrow night because having the families of members of our firefighters attend a similar session allows them to be more prepared. We're all volunteer firefighters, every single one of us. And so in the middle of a call, I know I can leave my family behind because they're prepared. Uh, so I've got my first session with the fire department tomorrow night. And I hope, I think we're over time. Um, that covers uh, our programs, the highlight. There are some other programs coming online. Now part of our uh, annual work plan is I brought up to the uh, uh, planning committee advisory committee. Uh, just, I have to throw this out there that do you realize that there is no program in Nova Scotia uh, to actually man manage spontaneous volunteers. Volunteers, people just want to help. Can I fill sandbags? Can I do anything? And so uh, I'm moving forward with that program as part of our uh, work plan, annual work plan, working with Red Cross because they would be setting up reception centers for shelters. And I've already talked to the head of Red Cross, Ansel Langeal, the fact that they could modify their software. Having that registration process is fill sandbag, fill sandbag. And all of a sudden, oh, you're a structural engineer. Oh, we have a building issue with things. So understanding what your volunteers bring, your community volunteers are important. To sit there and gather your community volunteers and say, go sit over there, we'll call you when we need you. They sit for 12 hours, are they gonna show up at the next disaster? No. So we are now have that on our program scope of trying to put things together as well and that will come out in the subsequent year. So, thank you very much for your time. Councillor Elliott. Thank you. Um, just before you get out of here, <laughs> <laughs> I happened because I went to the seniors day at Global Pet Foods uh, to run into the former CAO of Berwick. And I was telling him about the, um, the uh, uh, comfort center requirements. And he said that in Berwick, the comfort center is at the fire hall, but if people need a place to sleep, then they use the old school gym which is part of the town hall complex should we be thinking about the school as that place well the school is the key shelter here it's a large facility it has the showers the generator can hook in there if you go from the step of having a comfort center where you have wide scale evacuation and understand our comfort centers are not um wolf Hills comfort center these are king's county comfort centers king's remo 
because we have emergency transportation support from King's Transit. If it was so bad in Berwick, I had to think people out here, we could do that and they would be coming here. So it, it, they're, they are community centers, but we could transport people. Uh, to activate the school as a shelter is the whole step up to coordinating with David Floyd, who's the manager with respect to Annapolis Valley Regional Center of Education, bringing in the generator, Red Cross, and Red Cross would set it up. So, well, in that case, it's going to be two generators. Your light's off, then. Sorry. In that case, well, yes, if there's, if there's already a generator that's designated for the school, but that generator goes to the Lions Club, you'd need another generator. If the Lions Club, if this program coming out isn't spe specifically tailored to Lions Clubs, only community centers, and you could, I actually think, call a Lions Club a community center. Uh, so we'll, the details of that program are coming out. Okay, thank you. Seringham? Uh, yeah, I just have uh, one comment and then one question. Um, thank you so much for that uh, that presentation because I did learn a lot. One, the one thing I, I did learn is my emergency preparation kit is really only a power outage kit. And that's what I think that a lot of people think of. Um, so this sort of enlightened me. Um, the, one, the other thing that it sort of came to mind is that I don't have a landline and how important a, a landline is to have. Mm -hmm. and. And also a transistor, you know, radio, those, those things. We're so used to all the technology and everything like that. Um, so, um, cause I was without power for three days and I even couldn't click on your text to, to get that information or anything. And then it was scary to go outside and even let my dog, you know, have a bathroom break. Um, so that was the first time that I felt like I need to stay in place. Um, but my question is, I, I think the backpacks are a really good message to get out there. And do you recommend the backpacks? Like, do you have a specific place? Because I'm thinking about you're grabbing them and it's an emergency and you know, you're in your pajamas or something. Do you have a recommended place? And do you recommend one for each family member? Is there a certain age that you, you think they should be responsible for them? Yes, good question. I can't pick on a specific age number, but yes, one for each family member, definitely. Your children's ones have their specific requirements in them, uh, their toiletries, their clothes, but the one for each family member. Uh, overly prepared, uh, first off, an example from Port McMurray, a gentleman had left and gone to work. So if you really want to be prepared, having the emergency kit and the ready to go bag at home, what's your emergency kit in your car? Who's got an emergency kit in their car? So having an emergency kit in your car and that changes seasonally, but having an emergency go bag, even sometimes depending how long you work at your work facility, at work, the gentleman in Fort McMurray was told we're evacuating. He goes, oh good, I'll just go home and grab some things. Got halfway home barriers evacuated. So he had nothing. He didn't have an emergency kit in his car, or a go bag. My wife and I've decided to split ours. Both were hanging in the garage. And of course, ridiculous. The garage bursts in flame and there goes bags. But I have, we have a front door, back door. And so one's downstairs, one's upstairs. So we can, she can grab both or just grab one and go. But having them split like that as well is, an, is just an extra backup instead of having it all in one location, especially if it could be a hazard area. Most times I tell people, and now this is the perspective of being a firefighter for eight years, is that I put more weight behind having that emergency go bag. And that's, you can easily, how many people have extra backpacks at home? It's something you put together. Red Cross does the good have emergency go bag kits, but they're again, costly for family members. Uh, but actually throwing in the extra set of track pants and clothes, and we're coming up to winter, having the winter clothes, having a USB stick of the documents, having that extra cash if Bell and East Link go down, uh, the extra set of boots or something else in that kit and go. Uh, so that's important. Right. Yeah, I just, to ask no, I'm not. I just, um, and he didn't go home. So yeah. he, he said the first night he would go home after three hours and that didn't happen. Um, I just wanted to say it's been, you know, we're truly lucky to have Dan working in our corner. All four CAOs talk about that frequently. You know, you really can see it. Um, when we're in an event like Fiona, just the level of preparedness. And Dan certainly put in a lot of hours this week, um, both preparing and then taking us through the event. And I did want to mention, because I know I had it in the CAO report, but I don't know if it ever really got airtime at council. But just a reminder, if it did, that last December, Dan was actually recognized through Public Safety Canada um, through the Emergency Management Exemplary Service Award in the Resilient Communities category. And he was recognized by Ottawa as being... <laughs> And uh, we're very lucky. So I just thought I'd give that uh, that shout out because he's a tremendous asset to Remo and to the region. That's Aaron in the corner out of the first set of question marks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
I made them wear their vests. If there are no other questions, thank you so much, Dan. Very informative. And uh, again, to echo Aaron's comments uh, from all of us, thank you for everything you do to help keep us safe and keep us smart. Thank you for your time because I know how busy your schedules are. Thank you. Okay. Um, that brings me to, I will keep my comments very, very brief. Uh, you will see in the agenda that there were two proclamations this month. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder awareness uh, this month. And we did a Facebook post of, for that early in the month. And also uh, September 26th to October 2nd, uh, we've proclaimed this Right to Know Week. And both those uh, proclamations are in your, your agenda. And I believe uh, our town clerk posts those uh, in the hall. I have seen them there. So um, that's. Uh, but still a few more uh, comments to make. I think we were all uh, deeply saddened to, that Deep Roots uh, was canceled, probably not as saddened uh, as those volunteers who I know worked really, really hard on that. Um, and uh, we all recognize just how much work they put into that event and uh, how important it is to our community. So uh, um, our best wishes to them and hopefully we will have a Deep Roots event in 2023. And just finally, thank you to all of our staff for the work you did over the past uh, uh, hurricane event. Uh, we did have Team Wolfville, uh, I think you pulled a couple of nights, uh, I guess because you're so good, that that's why that happened. But thank you to all staff, uh, most of you who are sitting in this room and perhaps some who are not sitting in this room, uh, our deep appreciation to you for the work you did over that period. Thank you. I understand uh, that we have no one for public input. Is that still the case? Um, as far as we know, I'm not hearing anything from Mike. So that will move us to our uh, motions from Committee of the Whole. And I just have to bring my agenda up again. Uh, just give me a sec. And the first item is the skateboard bylaw. And uh, unless I see staff uh, wanting to uh, make any other comments about those, um, these various motions, I will just assume uh, that we will move each one and then I'll ask council if they have any questions or, or comments. So uh, would somebody like to read into the record the uh, uh, move the, the motion related to the skateboard bylaw? Councilor Butler. I move that council give first reading to the repeal of bylaw chapter 109, repeal of skateboard bylaw number 70 as attached to RFD 044-2022. Thank you, Councilor Butler. And a seconder, please. Councilor Ingham, are there any comments or questions from members of council? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That's passed. And uh, RFD 045-2022, the taxi bylaw. And Caden's going to come up because we did okay. have a legal review and he'll just walk okay. through those Thank recommended you. changes. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so we're bringing this back. We did have a legal review with our uh, lawyer lawyer Charles. So I just wanted to run through it and give a brief update of the few things that changed. Um, there's not too many, but definitely something to make everyone aware of. Um, in Committee of the Whole, I went through the, I, I'll make a point that the red is still something that we changed from the original policy. And then as I get further down, you'll see blue, which is our lawyer, lawyer Charles that he went uh, okay. through. So as a recap, we did add the disqualifying conditions. Nothing has changed there. Um, we added the definitions to make everything a bit more clear, uh, the pedicab and rickshaw bike um, that we wanted to add in. And then Charles recommended clarifying the taxi. Um, he just encompassed everything under taxi so that it, there's no confusion um, as to if the pedicab is a taxi, if the taxi is a pedicab, that sort of thing. Um, and he made sure to clarify that everything's under the Motor Vehicle Act and, and such. Uh, we went through the biggest thing that was changed was we changed the wording so that the applications were not as schedules. 
So that being said, um, they're now just an application. So if we do need to make changes to the application, we can do so without amending the full bylaw. If they were schedules, we would have to amend the whole, whole bylaw for, for a simple change if needed. So that was a big thing that he recommended. So that's one thing we changed. Um, by doing so, we did add the um, liability, um, insurance purposes, stuff like that, um, the expiry date and such. Just to clarify um, who can operate and who cannot. Um, we went through, these are all still changes that uh, existed during community of whole. Uh, the big blue here, so this from A to H, those would have been in the schedule in the application, but since those would not be attached to the bylaw because they're separate, he, he felt that we should add them in the bylaw just so while reading it, um, it was in there and there's no surprises when the application came forward. So that just clarifies what's required when submitting an application for a driver or a license or anything like that. Um, and other than that, um, same here, we did the making sure that a taxi owner license is displayed in the, in the taxi so that anyone entering the taxi knows for sure that this is a licensed vehicle. Um, going forward, this also speaks to pedicab and rickshaw bikes, uh, mentioning that they do have to follow the helmet regulations as per Nova Scotia Motor Vehicle Acts. So they do fall, fall under that for um, enforcement. Keep going. Uh, Jahi has added more clarification that if the applicant has any disqualifying conditions, they do not meet any requirements. And other than that, um, we also added the point where, let's go back there. We also made a point where they, um, we added a point that was not in the previous policy that spoke to smoking in vehicles that's not permitted for a driver or passenger. Uh, we've got cigarettes, uh, marijuana or e-cigarettes. So that's prohibited as well. So that is pretty much, that's the, the compass of the changes since community as a whole. And if there's any questions. Okay. Thank you, Caden. Are there any, yeah. Councillor Butler? I just have a quick question. What is, what is kind of the, the bare bones process of a complaint if somebody has a complaint? Like if they just approach you on the street and say, I was in a cab the other day, it clearly the driver has been smoking in the cab. What can I do about that? Yeah, so definitely we'll take that up and we can contact the company, um, let them know. I guess fo following this, we'll have to talk to CJ is the biggest one in Wolfville. So we'll let them know the bylaw is amended, these changes, and this will have to be followed. Um, we will investigate any complaint that comes forward and make sure that it doesn't happen. Um, I'll also speak with local RCMP also because they were the previous authority just to see um, any complaints previously, how they address them, and we'll uh, communicate how to go forward. Just to follow up on Councillor Butler, so if, if uh, a councillor mm -hmm. hears a complaint on the street or an email, we would direct them to you? Yep, so this now, uh, it says the licensing authority would be a person appointed by the CAO of the Town of Wolf for the purposes of the bylaw. So that would be us or anyone appointed by it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Elliott? So Caden, I had a complaint this week. Okay. Yeah. I heard a complaint this week, yeah. um, and it was around uh, waiting times. Okay. And this individual was told a driver will be right along, mm -hmm. and it took like half an hour. And when the driver arrived, he hadn't got the message. Okay. And this person was very frustrated. Is, mm -hmm. Does that fit anywhere in the in the bylaw? It's it's not written in, in this one. I. That would be something more company based, I believe. Yeah. If, if their waiting times are quite longer, I think they, they should announce that during the call. And if their drivers aren't responding promptly, that's something that CJ Taxi would have to address. Yeah, it sounded like it was poor communication between dispatch and the driver. Yeah, that could be. It. Yep. Um, I also just wanted to note that we also added a section that states the, that CJs would have to submit the rate schedule for, for the town, for the licensing authority, and they would also have to display that rate within their cab. So there's no surprise at the end of the trip that it's $20 more than you thought, which they should have that displayed. And they also must be able to provide receipt for their passengers. So if they request a receipt, digital or physical, they can provide that as well. 
I have another question now. Is okay. there is there a time frame for price increases in there? <laughs> I know when the when the price of gas was was going up, mm -hmm. I I took a cab one day. I took it two days later, and it went up by three dollars. Really? Yeah, that I'm not aware With of. With no, I can, I can definitely look into it. No notice or nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely look into. I don't know the answer. Okay. Head, but... And and I'm sure there's nothing that can be that's in there about com not compatible comparable pricing between companies. I don't believe so. I think that's just it's up to just the company, company based. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Would uh, somebody like to read the motion into the record? Move the motion into the record, uh, Councillor Ingham. I would move that council give first reading to the amended taxi bylaw chapter 40. I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Proudfoot. Uh, any other questions? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That's passed. The council correspondence motion. Deputy Mayor, if you could read that. Can I interrupt and ask a question? Is that in the agenda package? No, we didn't include the RFD from Cal because Cal actually had a full policy and then council decided not to move forward with the policy and pass this motion instead. So to avoid confusion, we just didn't put it in the package because it was a moot point. Okay. okay. Um, I move the council do not include the public correspondence section in council agenda package. Second for that, please, Councillor Butler. And that, of course, would be effective after this council because you will notice that there is in this Mm -hmm. Is are, are there any questions, Mayor? Uh, no. no, you had your light on. Oh, so. Any other questions? Any discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That is passed. Virtual meeting policy. Yep. So after discussion at Committee of the Whole, there were three changes that were made. Uh, council members are limited to attending three virtual meetings per year where the meetings are pre-scheduled, and that's across all meetings. Cow Council and Committee. Uh, council may request to attend any ad hoc meeting virtually, and we did a, we did attempt to define ad hoc. And one week's notice will be given to meetings which are moving to fully virtual. Those were the three changes that were requested. Somebody move this, Councillor Elliott. I would move RFD 009-2022. Um, that council approve a policy number 110-014, council and committees of council, virtual meeting policy with amendments as presented. Thank you, Councillor Elliott. A seconder, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Are there any comments or questions, Councillor McKay? Thank you. Yeah, I have a couple that I might suggest. Um, in 5.21 in the policy, Okay, to find this um, get to get used to doing this on here. Okay. Um it says there will be a request to do so to, to be virtual through the mayor and CIO. Is it a request or is it a notification? And if it's a request, then it probably should only say mayor and not the CAO. So I don't think we would request from staff to be not present. So the word request could be there but we're allowed three so is it a request or is it a notification i think probably notification, notification. Okay. yeah we uh, can make that change okay it's not permission being granted you're able to miss just have three so like just yes yeah, just wording but um okay. dun, dun, dun. there's one where if it says if your camera if you lose your camera and you lose connectivity and you cannot participate in the discussion should you, if you come back on, should you be permitted to vote? That's a question. Um, and then there was another one where it says, it says your camera should be switched on. And I think it should say for the entirety of the meeting. I think it just says we'll be left, should be on, but I think it should say for the entirety of the meeting, just for clarification mm -hmm. sakes. So my question though was on, if you lose connectivity and come back on, what is your voting right? <laughs> that would be, I'm yeah, that, that's up for discussion for, okay. for council. Okay. Yeah. We'll take your direction. What, what, do you have a position? Well, yeah, I was thinking like, cause if you, if you don't hear the discussion, you shouldn't be able to vote. And if you left 
the meeting for whatever, and then it was the vote was on, you, you could vote because you're present for that, you know, you're online, your camera's back on. But if you missed the discussion, I feel like you shouldn't be able to vote because you wouldn't be educated in the discussion that happened. And, and presumably <clears> that <throat> is if me. you missed the whole discussion, if something happened and you lost, lost the connection and, had, and, you know, and had to come back on, that, that does happen virtually. Other comments, Deputy Mayor? Um, I think that's a good point right. of whether whether it's in person or virtually. Yeah. Because for example, if I have a medical appointment and I miss the first part of the meeting and I come in, I wouldn't expect to necessarily vote on an item that I had to participate. So I think it's a broader discussion than just the virtual um, um, policy. It's just, the question around whether you're voting or not if you've not been at the part of the discussion that's being voted on. I agree. And for this one, I just put it as part of the virtual one, but I, after this, if we all agreed, we'd probably have to go back to the attendance one and just make that small clarification again, but. So, more more? Yeah, we can make that clarification in section 5.5 in the second paragraph where it speaks to the disconnection. If you wanted clarity that if you miss the discussion on any particular item, then you won't be eligible to vote if that's the wishes of council. How does council feel about that? I, I agree with that hearing. Yeah. So there are three. Pardon me. Yes. So there are there are three edits, that being one. Um, yeah, just want to get the three that Jody mentioned. Jody, just run by those three. Yep. So it was on edits, five, I guess we'll call sure. Five point two one was request and should say notify. Right. Uh, connectivity was if you've been disconnected uh, and missing the discussion, you are unable to vote. To vote. Uh, and where it says you will leave your camera on, it should say for the entirety of the meeting. Okay. Clerk, did you yeah. get that? Thank you. Okay, good being there. Um, I, I think I would like to separate out the connectivity one from the vote because um, you can lose connectivity and then come back and kind of pick up if there's no vote. So I, I think the question for me is, if you haven't been part of the discussion around a particular item that members are going to vote on, whether it's virtual or whatever, you the practice has been, and that what we support is that you don't vote on that item. I wholeheartedly agree, but this is just the virtual policy. So I think whether you are present or lose connectivity, you do not have the right to vote. Right, but I guess what I'm just thinking is if you happen to miss part of that virtual meeting for whatever reason, not just connectivity. That's why I guess I'm, yes, I'm not I sure. I think that's I been picked up in the, in the subsequent five, what was that, Erin? 5.2? 5.5 speaks to if you become disconnected okay. from the meeting due to technical problems or other reasons, the minute shall reflect that said member left the meeting at the time of the disconnection. Right. And then we could add some clarification there that if that, prevents you from hearing the full discussion that you're not able to vote, we can. Okay, but I, I guess what I'm suggesting is that we leave it at that and then there is a separate item that if for whatever portion of that meeting is missed, whether it's connectivity or you were only able to join after a certain point, then if there's voting involved, you wouldn't vote if you're involved in the, if you're not involved in the discussion, right. but it's not just the question of could right. I think what we said was that that, that could be a minor amendment in the attendance policy. This because it's virtual, which would obviously cover this. This because it's virtual. The issue is if you lose your connection, even though you're still sitting in the room where the meeting is, you're not present. So did we not, did we so, not uh, say, <laughs> I, I don't want to lose this. Did we not say that we'd make a little tweak to the attendance policy? I didn't hear, I, oh, I just okay. heard that it was a bigger issue. I didn't hear that's which not, policy you wanted to revisit that. Uh, but yeah, if that's the desire, we can come back with the attendance policy with that tweak, which is essentially the same thing, but we reflected in that. Is that the... My intention was if this was agreeable, then I would bring a request to, for the next committee of the whole to bring back the attendance <coughs> one to have that tweak added. Okay. That was my intention, if everyone was agreed. 
if that's a direction we can concurrently take that and bring it back as the so, housekeeping. I guess my question, if that was done, if that comes back and gets tweaked, then here, then it would super, it would cover this as well. And now we're talking about connectivity. Like I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not sure what other reason I, I guess not covered by the attendance twig other than connectivity. Well, somebody could be attending virtually, but yes. only able to attend part of the virtual. Right. And meeting. I assume that would be covered so by the attendance policy. policy. Correct. Yeah. So if that is covered under the attendance policy, to me, it's, it's doing it twice by also including it in the, the connectivity piece. But it does, <laughs> it's splitting here. So it's, it I have a question. Um, so okay. as you said, you have to have the video camera on. What if you lose the video for five minutes, but you're still able to talk the whole time? You should be able to vote on that. Is that, am I, am I reading that correctly? If say your video just goes off, but you're you know in on the conversation the whole time and you're still able to speak, yeah. are you still able I, to vote? I think that's what we were talking about. You might just have a moment glitch yeah. in your video or something, which is different than your whole system going down and you can't participate. We're, we're, but I guess we also did say so that you need to be time, you need to be present, and it was but, to mean, address people who come on to meetings and don't put their video on. Mm -hmm. Not just for a moment because you lost connect connectivity, but because you don't have your video on. That was what mm -hmm. this was trying to address. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I would think if you actually said, oh, I've lost my video, I'm trying to reconnect, I, I don't think you'd be penalized. For okay. That. Am I right? We're getting into the nitty-gritty of things. So I just wanted to check. Isabel. I can. I feel you're not, have you, have you felt answered? Okay. Okay. Question. This motion is on the floor, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all in favor, please. With those uh, minor amendments being made, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, it is passed. Uh, Council professional development policy. We'd like to read that into motion. Council Butler. <clears throat> I move that council approve the changes to the council conference and professional development policy 110-004 and that council agree to send their conference and training plan for the next two years to the budget process for discussion at the first session in November. Thank you, a seconder please. Councilor McKay, is there any discussion? I know some members of council have sent in some of their requests for the remainder of this year already. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That is passed. And Maple Avenue resurfacing. Deputy Mayor? Um, RFD. 050-2022 Maple Avenue resurfacing. I move the council approve a maximum of $80,000 uh, be incurred in this fiscal year to resurface portions of Maple Avenue. The expenditure will be funded by way of a transfer from the town's unrestricted operating revenue res reserve fund. Thank you. Seconder, Councillor Elliott. Is there any questions or comments? Councillor McKay? Um, I have a question. Where is this slated in the timeline of being done? Because I understand that um, we're, you know, we're at the discretion of others doing the paving. So, and I, I've asked other questions about other places getting done. So I'm just making sure, and we had a discussion about this about it. Where does this sit in our timeline? And is it going to be done within this fiscal year? which would I guess would have to be soon because it's- It will be done this fall October. if this motion is passed, but Alex can give maybe okay. more details. Okay. It's when the contractor is able to come back to do all of our milling and paving program that would get added in. That's, that's exactly right. Thank you, Erin. Uh, the, the contractor has indicated that they have the capacity to do that before the winter this year. Um, so typically we see paving completed before November 30th. Sometimes that stretches into December, depending on the weather. Uh, but I would expect to see that done before, before the snow is on the ground. Okay. 
Yep, in there? No? <laughs> all right, question? All, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That is passed. Appointment of the alternate to the IMSA pilot board. Uh, we'll have a mover for that, please, Councillor Kingham. I would move that council appoint uh, Councillor Jody McKay as the alternate member for the town of Wolfville to serve on the interim IMSA board of directors for the duration of the pilot project. Seconder, please, uh, Councillor Elliott. Um, I'll just before I call the vote, there was some confusion. I think um, Councillor. McKay is the alternate. This is the, the uh, main appointee was, are the mayors and wardens. Um, I think I understand there was a bit of confusion about that the last time. So I just wanted to clarify that in case there was still confusion. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Well, that is carried. And Council McKay, I'm gonna ask you to read this next one as it's an audit. Yep. Uh, I would move that council approves the following lines of credit with the Bank of Montreal effective October 1st, 2022 to September 30th, 2023. The town operating fund bank account uh, to a maximum credit of 700,000. The water utility operating fund bank account, uh, the maximum credit of $150,000 and the corporate credit cards, all cards combined to a maximum credit of $50,000. Seconder, please. Uh, Deputy Mayor, my dear boss, are there any comments or questions? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That is passed. Uh, correspondence, our last, uh, our last correspondence, um, and we will receive these. Uh, this will be the last time uh, now that uh, this correspondence will show up in our agenda. Which brings us to... Motion to adjourn. Councillor Butler and the seconder, please. Councillor awesome. Councillor Elliott, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.